So, welcome back. Um, we've had a bit of a break the last few weeks. We had some room scheduling conflicts, so we had to change things around a little bit. So, just as a reminder, um, we're going to do a little talk today about retraction. And then uh, next week, um, Beth from the Cell Profiler team um, from Maine Carpenter's Lab at MIT is going to be here. She's going to talk to us a little bit about the Cell Profiler. And then uh, two weeks after that, on the 20th, um, Dr. Hal is going to talk to us all about IntelliSys, which is a new machine learning segmentation program. I know a lot of you have been using uh, it's really in popularity quite quickly. Um, so just a reminder, that's what's coming up. Right. So uh, for today, I think this is probably the wittiest, best title I've ever come up with for one of these talks. I will explain it to you now. So I want to talk to you about refraction. And the reason I call it the other fraction is because I feel every single talk that we've ever done in this lecture series has always shown some form of this equation and talked about how a light microscope is limited by diffraction. diffraction. So we're always talking about diffraction and how you get two fluorescent molecules that are too close together and you can't see them. And we're always harping on diffraction and resolution um, over and over and over again. But the one thing we never really talk about is refraction. And it's kind of interesting because if you talk to somebody who, whose hair is whiter than mine, whose mustache grows thicker than mine, who's been doing microscopy for a long time, um, this was all sorted out ages ago. And then the fluorescence confocal microscope came along in the early 90s and made refraction a huge problem again. There's a bunch of people that looked into this in the early 90s. There's this flurry of papers in the microscopy journals um, all looking into this problem. But to be honest, it, it never, I should say it never got solved. But the ways to get around refraction aren't common practice in what we do. So I guarantee you that uh, everything you put under the microscope has probably suffered in some way from refraction. So this is what I want to talk to you a little bit about today. And so refraction, we all remember from high school. Uh, this is actually my son's favorite magic trick right now, is daddy, I can break a pencil by throwing in a cup of water. Um, so we all remember that light travels at different substances. Obviously it goes really nice and fast through air, but if you try and send it through glass, it slows down. And I apologize, this diagram here is not drawing the scale, but everything else on the other slide is. Um, but what happens is, is when light hits an interface between two substances, where it's going to go at a different speed in, in one substance versus the other, it bends. And we call that refraction. Um, and that happens whether it's going from a fast to a slow area or from a slow area to a fast area. We get this bending of light. And that's really well defined by Snell's law. And the biggest um, important consideration when figuring out how much your light is going to bend is the difference in the refractive index between your two substances. Uh, that tells you um, how much of a bend you're going to get there. So our big question is, where does refraction occur in the microscope? And the unfortunate answer to this is everywhere. <laughs> you have a light path that's full of a bunch of pieces of glass and a lot of air. And every time you hit one of those interfaces, there's some refraction going on there. Right? So this is obviously a big problem in microscopy. And the truth is, even if you just look at a single lens, so here we just have a single positive lens that's going to take some parallel light rays on this side and try and focus them to a focal point. There is virtually no possible way to make a spherical lens that will focus these all to the exact same point if you're just working with one curved surface, one refractive index surface. Right? And what usually happens is these, what we call the paraxial rays, so the rays that are close to the optical axis, they do okay, they get focused to the focal point really well. But the ones that are hitting out at the periphery here of the lens, 
these end up actually getting focused a little in front of our focal point. Right? And this is what we call spherical aberration. So you've probably heard of that. I'm not going to say refraction much today. I'm going to talk mainly about spherical aberration. And that's the idea that these rays that hit at different points on our lens get focused to different positions on the other side of the lens. Right? I'm going to talk about five big problems that this produces in our microscope today. But right now, I'm just going to start out with three. And these are three that you've probably heard about, definitely the first two when I'm talking about spherical aberration. And this applies not just to microscopy, but photography and uh, astronomy and lots of other things as well. Um, but because all these rays are not getting focused to the same point, that means we're going to have a clearer image. So we're not going to get all of that light on the detector. Things are going to be a little bit different. It's going to be blurred because they're not coming to a sharp focal point anymore. They're getting blurred out in space. So that's going to lower our resolution a little bit of our image. And the other thing that it's going to do in, in regards to our microscope is it's actually going to shift the focal plane. Okay? And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But these are kind of three main effects of spherical aberration that are harming your, your image. So as far as the inside guts of the microscope, through years and years of development, um, there have been a number of things that have been used to correct spherical aberration within the light path of the microscope. So these are two kind of common ways to do it. One is to take um, two lenses that have half the focusing power of what you need and sandwich those side to side. To side. This is a way to lessen spherical aberration. Obviously, you're putting in more optical elements, so you're also getting a bit of reflection at all of these surfaces, so that's going to decrease the light throughput of, of your instrument. Um, and the other way to do it is to take uh, a negative lens um, and just glue it up against the positive lens. And this can also be used to um, reduce uh, spherical aberration. The other thing that can sometimes be used to is a really crazy shaped lens that actually bulges out kind of in the middle here. Um, it's called an aspheric lens. That's another way to get rid of spherical collaboration as well. So I showed you one of these diagrams before where we just cut a microscope objective in half. Obviously, an objective isn't just a single lens. There's a whole bunch of lens elements in there. And these elements are correcting for a lot of different flaws in our system, so chromatic aberration, uh, flatness of field, but also a lot of these lens elements are there to try and correct for the spherical aberration. So that means that the light coming in and the light coming out, or if you're going the other way in this objective, is mostly free of spherical aberration. Okay. Um, that said, most microscopes work as an entire system, so if you remember our lectures about how a microscope works, there's another important element in that microscope called the tube lens. So a lot of manufacturers will use the objective lens in conjunction with the tube lens to correct for, for some of these different aberrations. So not absolutely everything is done necessarily here, but most of it is. Okay, so we have this objective that's fairly well corrected for its spherical aberration. But there's one more very important element to every objective, and that's what goes right here. Does anybody know what goes right there? What do you put in front of that objective? Oh, I'll be talking to Usually it comes with a bottle. It sits on the table next to the microscope. Oil, or water, or glycerol, some, some sort of immersion media, right? Um, it doesn't have to be something like you put there, air is also considered an emergent media. And this is a very important characteristic of your objective, right? So for example, if you have an air objective, you take that bottle of oil and put it on that air objective, it ruins your image. So this is a good reason not to do that. Then we don't have to pick it up and read that. Right? So <clears throat> let's take a look at a few different objectives here. Right? Um, the objectives themselves have a lot of information printed on them, and this information is going to help you figure out how to best minimize the spherical aberration in your system, keeping in mind that the immersion media in front of the objective is an integral part of that optical system. Okay? So 
first of all, I have to commend many of you because I do not hear you talking about magnification anymore. So thankfully, I have finally got that through you. But magnification doesn't mean anything unless you're talking about a camera. But most of the time, it doesn't. What really matters is this numerical aperture we said. So that's what's going to determine our resolution. So if we take a look at our numerical apertures on these particular objectives, you can see they increase as we kind of go left to right here. And one of the big reasons for that is because of the immersion media that they're working with. So we've talked about this in a, in a number of different lectures before. But the higher the refractive index of your immersion media, the higher the numerical aperture of your objective can be, the better resolution you can get. So we've got an objective over here on the right that's an oil immersion objective. So it says oil right on there. We've got this one that says W, probably a water immersion objective, right? And then we've got these other ones that just say M, IMM. -M. Um, and what that means is these objectives can actually work with multiple types of immersion media, okay? And so the next thing that you'll hopefully notice is that the ones that say M on here have one of these things. So this is a correction collar. Right? So this is a little dial that you can turn on the inside of the objective, and you can adjust it to the type of immersion media that you're using. So if we take a look at this guy over here, we can see it says oil. Over here, it says glycerol, water. And there's a big black line on that correction collar. So that means we can adjust this correction collar either over towards the water side or the glycerol, depending on what we're putting on that objective. Okay. This one is also has these little markings side by side here, which you probably can't see. But in these two markings side by side, they look almost identical, except the one on the left here has another little line underneath it. And what that means is that if you're on the marking with the line, you're correcting for a cover slip. And if you're on the one without the line, that means you can use it as a dipping objective, just dip it straight into the water. Okay? So that one's pretty straightforward. Same with this one over here. Uh, we've got a W for water, we've got glycerol <coughs> over here, so we can adjust it and clean those. But what about this one? This one doesn't, this just has numbers on it. So this is another thing to keep in mind. No correction collar is equivalent. There is no standardization in how these things are labeled. Um, so sometimes they're labeled based on the actual immersion media. In this case, this one's being labeled based on the thickness of the cover slip that we're using. Okay. Uh, another thing that sometimes you'll see is they're actually just stamped on different refractive indices. So the numbers actually refer to standard or refractive indices. Um, or if they are talking about distance, like this one, it's written in micrometers. Sometimes they can also be written in millimeters. Okay. So it's um, there's absolutely no convention to these. You have to be really paying attention to, to what you're using. Okay. <coughs> and then finally, the last thing that's really important here as far as your collaboration goes is these little markings that tell you what size of the cover screen you should be using. Okay. So pretty much every, micro, every objective in our facility is designed for uh, 170 micrometer thick cover slip. Usually that's labeled on the cover slip box as a number 1.5. Um, so this is really important. There are some objectives like this one here that can be used over a broader range of those, but pretty much all you ever need is to just have number 1.5 cover slips in your lab, and then you'll be all set. One last thing to point out is this correction color here has this black line and a red line on it. Any idea what the difference is between those two lines? This is an objective that's often used for live cell imaging. Temperature. Exactly. So the red line is if you're working at 37 degrees Celsius, you use that one. Um, and the black line is if you're at room temperature. Okay. <coughs> so, um, we have these different objectives that can use different um, immersion media. And so if you're up in the facility, you're going to see these bottles all over the place. And they all look very similar. But it's good to know that at a number of our different microscopes, there can be up to 
I think at one we have four different models, okay? And each one is actually different. So um, if you look at the side, they're all called Immersol, that's the Zeiss name for immersion media. Uh, this one here is called Immersol G, so it's meant to work with most all immersion objectives. This one is Immersol W. It always has this um, sticker on the top that usually looks light blue. Sometimes the older ones start to look a little bit white. Um, so Immersol W is meant for water objectives. And then the one that's most common is this 518 app. Uh, and that's the one for our standard oil immersion objectives. Uh, some of these 518 apps, they have a white sticker on the top that needs to say 30 or 37. Those are ones that have been adjusted for working at higher temperatures. Okay, so 30 just refers to 30 degrees Celsius, 37 degrees Celsius. Okay. And we've got all those in the facility, so if you're looking for a particular one and can't find it, just, just have to ask for one of those. Cool. So here are three very basic requirements to minimize spherical aberration. So this is the absolute minimum you should be doing before you start an experiment. So make sure that the immersion medium matches your objective, okay? Oil objective, let's use that 518F immersion. And remember that temperature matters too, okay? Uh, second thing, make sure you're using this number 1.5 thickness cover slip, which is the equivalent of 170 micrometers. And the third thing is if you're using an objective with a correction collar, make sure that correction collar is adjusted and in the right position. Okay. So this is the absolute minimum that you should be doing before you start an experiment. And if you do this absolute minimum, that means if we take a look at our imaging system here where we have our objective, we have our immersion media, we have our cover slip, we've got our sample and our microscope slide, if you do those three things, you are absolutely, perfectly, 100% set to image a fluorescent molecule that's right against this cover slip. All right? Everything is corrected perfectly to image that fluorescent molecule right there against that cover slip. As soon as you try to image one underneath that, you're screwed. Okay? So this, to this point right here, that's only half the battle. And this is where 3D microscopy has really thrown everything for a bit of a loop, okay? So now we have our sample that's sitting in some sort of mounting media. And this can be anything from a refractive index close to water to a really high refractive index of some sort of exotic solvent, okay? And as soon as you move off of that interface right there at that cover slip, you're moving into a refractive index that doesn't necessarily match the rest of your system. So how do we figure out which one of these objectives would work in different immersions, so our oil, or water, or glycerol, how do we figure out which one of these should we be using? So the usual convention is always which one has the highest magnification or which one has the highest numerical aperture. But there's something else that we need to be considering when we're doing three-dimensional imaging. And this is why, all right? So if we pretend that this black line here is our cover slip, we have an immersion media on this side of our cover slip, and we've got a mounting media on this <coughs> side of our cover slip. They each have a unique refractive index. <coughs> if, the, if those two substances don't have unique refractive indices, if they have the same refractive index, the rays of light coming out of our objective are just, they aren't going to refract, they're just going to pass directly to the focal point. Everything's going to be great. We can image through that sample, no problem, in three dimensions. If we have a situation where the refractive index of our immersion media is higher than the refractive index of our mounting media, so for example, if you're using an oil immersion objective to image a live sample that's basically in water, What's going to happen is there's going to be a, refractive, a refraction event at this cover slip that bends those light rays so that they focus nearer to the objective than you're expecting them to. 
And this affects the rays on the outside of the objective more than the ones closer to the optical axis. So what you actually do is you spread out that focus over this entire distance. Okay. Now, if we have the opposite situation here, in this case, our refractive index of our mounting media is higher than the refractive index uh, of our immersion media, the opposite happens. So that refractive refraction event moves our focus lower and deeper into our sample and spreads out um, our information over this distance. And this is something that's common in clear tissue imaging. So often you use an air immersion objective um, and you image into a high refractive index filling solution. So this can be a big problem. So in this situation, you're inducing all kinds of uh, sphere collaboration. So this is an interesting question and, and way to look at this is how do I match my objective to my mounting media. And I told you that if you talk to someone who's been doing microscopy forever, this isn't a big problem. Because this never used to be a big problem because <coughs> <laughs> days before fluorescence, this was the mounting media of choice called Canada Balsam. Right? And if you notice the refracted index of Canada Balsam matches perfectly to an oil version. The other thing, this was well before the time of the confocal, so they're just looking at very thin sections, usually in 2D. All right? So it didn't matter at all. Um, in live cell situations, we can do a little bit better now. So if you have a sample sitting in PBS or some sort of live cell buffer, uh, it usually has a refractive index close to that of water. And if we put a water immersion objective on our system, we've got a good refractive index match on this side of our cover slide. Everything should look good. So these are all of the common mounting media that we see in the facility every day. So I'm sure you're familiar with these. Probably your favorite one is on that list. And if you look, what type of objective do most of these suggest you should be using? Glycerol immersion objective, right? How many of you use a glycerol immersion objective? Uh, how many of these do we actually have in the facility? Probably like three. Um, so this is a big, a big, big problem with fluorescence microscopy, um, specifically imaging in 3D, is that our immersion media of our objectives no longer matches the mounting media of most of our samples. Uh, if you're imaging something really small like a bacteria that's just stuck right on that cover slip, it doesn't matter at all. But when you're starting to image thicker tissues, this becomes really important. So the one thing that I will point out on this chart is um, this particular mounting media that we worked with Thermo Fisher with a couple years to develop. It's called Prolonged Glass. Um, so this has a refractive index that matches really well to your oil immersion objective. If you switch to this, you will definitely notice a difference in the sharpness of your images and the brightness of the bigger images if you're using an oil immersion. Um, the one drawback to it is it is a curing mounting media, so you will see some shrinkage of your sample in there. Um, sometimes that can be a problem for people, but other aside from that, you're going to see uh, a much higher quality image just using this particular mounting media. So the same thing goes for tissue clearing solutions. Um, these could be all over the place as well uh, with the refractive indices. Um, the one nice thing is <coughs> we actually have some objectives that are really well matched to at least these clarity type solutions. Um, and anyone who's doing expansion microscopy, water immersion or water dipping objectives were fantastic for those types of things. Okay. Great. So I told you about these three detrimental effects of sphere collaboration, but I told you I actually want to talk about five of them today. So the next one that I want to talk to you about is this idea of how your z-axis scaling gets distorted when you're doing three-dimensional imaging through one of these refractive index mismatches. Okay. And here's what I mean by that. So let's take an example where we're using an air immersion objective. Um, obviously, air is a refractive index for F1. 
we're imaging into a clearing solution that has a refractive index around 1.52. Right. So if we take a look at our objective on the side here, these black lines are where that focal point would be if there was no refractive index mismatch, if it went exactly where we expected it to be. The light blue lines are where it actually goes based on this refractive index mismatch. Okay. So if we take that objective and we do our Z stack, for example, we're going to move it down closer to our cover slope while we're acquiring those Z stacks. So we're going to go the distance of this red arrow. If there is no refraction, you can see these black lines move the distance between these blue planes. Okay. Um, so this is how far our microscope thinks we've moved within our sample. So it thinks our sample looks like this sort of pancake circle. But in actual fact, we have moved from this focal point here to this one down here. And what that means is that our sample isn't actually a pancake like this, it's an actual sphere. But we've artificially pancaked it because when we render it in 3D, the microscope means we only move this distance because that's how far we check. Okay. So you can actually do some fancy math and take a look at these sort of two triangles where your expected focal point is, where your actual focal point is, and come up with a correction factor to correct for this. If you're interested in it, come talk to us. Um, we've actually packaged it into a little image shape macro that will do it automatically for you. Um, but here's a good example of this. So this is um, a section of mouse brain tissue. Um, the axons have been labeled with TD tomato. Uh, this is right here. And if you image through this tissue with a glycerol immersion objective, this is in uh, vector shield, so a standard um, glycerol based mounting media. So we have a really nice refractive index match here between our immersion media and our mounting media. So we shouldn't have any spherical aberration. We shouldn't have any focal shifts or anything. Um, so this is the axial projection of that data. If we image this with um, an objective that is almost identical, same numerical aperture, we have the same pixel spacing, same Z spacing, but this one has error immersion instead of glycerol. We have that refractive index mismatch now. And you can see this is what we actually see. Um, so our Z stack becomes much more compressed. You can see here it's about a 40% compression. Um, this is just running that image J macro on it afterwards to <coughs> for it. And you can see we can expand it out pretty much back to its actual dimensions. So another example of the same thing, this is uh, an organoid that was cleared using a hydroscope protocol. And uh, it should be about 500 micrometers in diameter and it should be a sphere. But if you image this with an air objective, um, and then you 3D render it, uh, or take an axial section through it, it gets pancaked, just like that blue sphere that I showed you earlier. Um, so once again, you can z-correct it with our macro, it becomes a sphere again. And if you actually were doing volumetric measurements of these objects, your volumetric measurement would have been incredibly correct uh, in the original image uh, versus what it actually is when you correct for that. Okay. So the next one, and this kind of goes hand in hand with, I just, with what I just showed you, is that you're also altering the z-step of your microscope. Okay. So I think a lot of you are used to seeing this z-step window on the microscope. So when you set your first and your last position, there's this button here that says optimal. And it tells you based on the objective that you're using, the wavelength of light that you're using, this is how often you should sample it and see. And you click that optimal button and never really think anymore about it. The problem here is that what you can see here is our focal plane, which is the orange lines here, are actually moving faster through our sample than our objective is moving. Okay? So, Although the microscope thinks this is your step size, in this situation, it's actually much bigger than that. And so that means you're under sampling 
your image. Right. So to give you an example of this, this is those same neurons again. And on the left hand side here, we took our Z samples at exactly what the microscope suggested we should. And on the right hand side, it was done again where we first calculated what the Z step should actually be. And what you can see here is if you take some intensity profiles along these lines here. Um, so the first two here are from the undersampled data, and the bottom two are from the properly sampled data. And these little red dots just uh, signify each individual axon that you can actually pick out in that Z range. You can see we can actually resolve far more axons uh, when we're doing the correct sampling than when we're undersampling. So if you have one of these refractive index mismatches and you're not correcting that Z step ahead of time, you're actually losing a lot of resolution and possibly a lot of information. And once again, this is just sort of the same thing to bring that home. Um, these are three areas from that last image where two axons come in very close proximity to one another. And what Aaron's done here is using the simple right trace here in the image J, just trying to segment out the two different axons as they come in close together. And you can see um, it does a very poor job of being able to segment them in the undersampled data. Um, so the white pixels are just pixels where it says these are the same thing for both axons. Um, but if we actually correctly sample that data, there's some situations where we're able to uh, fully resolve those two individual axons even though they're pretty close together. Okay. Uh, there's some areas where they're still too close to do it, but it does do a little bit better in those areas as well. Um, cool. So, now what we've hopefully figured out is that um, this mounting media that we have here is really important to consider this in relation to our immersion media. So ideally we want to have these equivalent to one another, but if we don't, if we can't do that, we have to figure out a way to correct the things um, before. We have to correct our Z-staff ahead of time and then correct our, our sample afterwards. Okay. So now, as long as we get these guys equal, this sort of area of no sphere collaboration, let's call it, we can extend that much deeper into our sample. And we're not limited to just imaging those floor floors that are right on the surface. Cool. So just for the last, let's say, five minutes, um, I want to try and give you one <coughs> practical uh, application or example of so this is some work that was done along with Kate Beckley's group, who she used to be at Beth Israel, and now she's moved to the Great Institute in the UK. Um, and her group is interested in the vasculature of the retina. So if anyone here has worked with a retina before, uh, the traditional way to do this is to take that retina, make a couple cuts into it, so that you can splay it out as this sort of flower petal and flat mounted on a microscope slide with a cover slip on top. And then it's usually imaged by people <coughs> with an air objective just to get a bigger field of view and be able to image that large area a little bit faster. Um, so Kate's group was kind of interested in seeing if uh, this traditional prep could be approved upon by using light sheet microscopy. Um, so what we did was we, we took these dissected retinas, we encased them in um, an agro block, put them in the light sheet microscope and imaged them, took them out, melted away the agros, then did the sort of traditional flat, flat mount prep, uh, and put them under the confocal microscope. And it turns out if you try, take a look at this vasculature, so these are the vessels inside the retina that have been labeled, um, the vessels appear as you would expect a vessel to, somewhat circular. Uh, when you image them on the light sheet. But in this confocal prep, you can see that they get really squished out and flattened out in that axial dimension. Um, some of this is from the prep, the mounting media, obviously, um, <coughs> definitely distorts the tissue. It shrinks a little bit in the mounting media. Um, they probably get crushed a little bit by the cover slip on top. But this is also contributed to 
um, dramatically, but that would probably be a nice mismatch from from using a compare objective to to enrich these types of examples. So when they went back and took a look at the light sheet data, um, they looked specifically at uh, a model of if you deprive uh, mouse embryo of the correct levels of oxygen while it's developing. Um, what happens is the, the vasculature gets kind of messed up. So you appear what, or what appears is what have always been called these tufts. And it was often thought of it was just kind of this pile of cells that was sitting on the vasculature that was trying to form in the PI. Um, and that's what they look like under comfortable clothes, just a pile of cells. But it turns out with the added resolution of having the refractive index matched properly in the light sheet of the water dipping objective, it turns out that these weren't piles of cells at all but there are actually little vessels that are just corkscrewing on top of each other. Um, so there is, they found a couple phenotypes, so they found these small tufts that are just small little twists, um, larger ones that are larger twists, and then they even noticed a number of these ones that actually look like a figure eight knot of performing. And this was stuff that you just couldn't see at all. What you've come away with today is the fact that spherical aberration and refraction play a big role in creating image quality, especially in 3D, 3D constant microscopy. And it's something that we've forgotten about. We don't pay enough attention to it. It's something that we should pay more attention to. And these are the reasons why. It's just that that refractive index mismatch is found in the volumetric quantitation that you're doing. Um, you're going to compress those images and they need to be corrected. This can affect your uh, axial sampling and you may lose information of important structures that you're trying to see. And if you do do a really good job of carefully considering all of this, you might actually see something like no one else has seen before. Yeah. Cool, so that's all I have to say today. Uh, there's a few people that I should thank. Um, so the, this whole refraction project started three years ago when Jeff and I were just chatting about this randomly um, and Aaron has since come on board and helped out with a lot of this project as well and the retinal vascular imaging I said obviously came out of Kate Beverly's group this is now a bioarchive preprint um, and a lot of the work was done on the biology side by Claudia who was posted off in Kate's lab and Kyle did a lot of that's it thanks for coming Yes. Is there so? Is there ever any <clears throat> any situation in which we would want to take a confocal z spec using an error objective, or is that just always a terrible idea? No, it's not a terrible idea. I mean, there's um, there are advantages to it. Um, speed usually you get a longer field of view, um, longer working distance. So most of these. Those are all in the oil immersion objectives. You're looking at a maximum working distance of 500 microns. Um, so if you want to go anything deeper than that, often your only choice is the air objective. Um, so yeah, it's definitely don't do this, um, but just realize that there's some considerations on the back end of how you correct that. Yeah, so it, um, there's four pieces of information that you enter into it. Uh, so it's the refractive index of your immersion media, the refractive index of your mounting media, numerical aperture of your objective, and the shortest wavelength of light that you're using for excitation. Um, and then what it does is you can run it before your imaging experiment, and it will tell you what your z-spacing should be. Um, and it will also tell you what your correction factor is going to be for your z-scaling. So there is a way that you can actually take that correction factor and input that into the Zeiss software immediately. Um, and then you don't have to do any of the post-processing afterwards. Um, 
So that's what you can do ahead of time, or if you do it afterwards, what it'll do is it'll actually take a look at your data, it'll read the metadata, see what the use case it was, correct that, resave it with the correct use case. Um, and basically, you want to use it any time that your uh, immersion media and your mounting media don't have the same requirement. 